and trying to work out, you know, which church God wanted them to be part of. And I'm so thrilled, and I'm, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, that God has brought you here. Bless you, and thank you for, for leading our, our, our worship this, mor- this morning. Okay, as I suppose, as, or for those who don't know me, um, you know, Ivor assumes that because he knows me, everyone else knows me. Well, the thing is, not everyone does. Uh, that um, in um, sort of the dark ages of England, um, I was minister of this church uh, many, now literally many moons ago. And that. So, um, you know, they do drag me back from time to time, you know, to take a, an odd service here and there just to prove that I'm still alive, I think. And that. Okay. Um, just to say as a little introduction to um, the message that I'm, I'm going to share with you is that in John's Gospel, there are a series of sayings of Jesus that are very significant because what he's saying is that I am God. I am not just a prophet. I am God. And these little sayings begin with I am. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd and so on. And why does he start with, I am? Because I am, in itself, is an important message. Because back in the Old Testament, when God was asked, you know, who are you, Lord? And he gave this brilliant answer, which must have scratched, caused many people to scratch their heads. And what he said was, I am that I am. I am what I am, in other words. And therefore, when he introduced these little sayings about himself, he's actually declaring himself as God. So which of these sayings um, are we going to focus on this morning? And it's actually, I am the bread of life. And I'm going to read a few verses leading into that just to give a context to what he's saying here. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite side of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias, sorry if you're following it in your scriptures, oh, it's actually, oh yeah, sorry, it's up on the screen. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten. Had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and the fish and had your fill. And then he starts this important uh, statement. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. To believe in the one that he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. 
but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never grow hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, I'm starting off a little warning because I'm going to talk quite a lot about food this, this morning. And if my memory serves me right, I can remember a time when when someone, and possibly someone who's present here, had to dive off in the middle of a service uh, because they weren't sure whether they'd switched the oven on or not. Well, if that is you, and you, you know, think about, you know, you're concerned about whether the food is on and ready for when you get back, just relax. God's got it under control, all right? I suppose, right, so moving on and being a little more serious than that, we've got this phrase, Jesus, bread of life. I wonder what that means to you. You know, yes, you know, I'm the good shepherd. That's a great one. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, another great one. I'm the light of the world. Yes. Often this one is one that isn't remembered, I suppose, or spoken about as much as some of the others. And one of the reasons, I think, is that throughout the the wide Christian community, there is difference of thought in terms of what this means and means as believers. So much so that When we come to communion, when we come to break bread together, whatever terminology we use for that, there are different opinions as to what it means. Is that we as uh, Protestants tend to think of the bread and the wine as being representative, a symbol of what Jesus went through on the cross in terms of his body and his blood. Whereas other parts of the church tend to think of it, or definitely think of it, that at a certain point in the service, normally the Eucharist prayer is that the bread and the wine that is brought forward literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And I think part of this comes from a difference of understanding of what Jesus means to this phrase, I am the bread of life, especially in the part of the story that goes on after the part that I read as that, as that narrative con- continues. And so we've got this wonderful word, transubstantiation, Um, I won't ask you to repeat it after me because, you know, it took me quite a time to get my head around it, let alone, um, you know, expecting others to do it. But what it means, and this is a very simple definition of it, that it's the change of the whole substance of bread into the substance of the body of Christ and of the whole substance of wine into the substance of of the blood of Christ. All right? Got it? In other words, that it literally becomes, when the, when the Eucharistic prayer is, 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 you know, is being read and there's the, the bells ringing and that, it literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus. But that's not how we look at things, as it? We see it simply as being symbolic of that. Okay, so moving on. I want you to think about this chapter, chapter 6. It's one of John's long 
chapters. There's over 70 verses in this, in this chapter. And it begins with a miracle story, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 men, let alone the women and the children, with just a little, one boy's little lunch. I always think that with this, with this story, that his mum must have heard Jesus preach before. And knowing her son's um, concentration time and the fact that Jesus could go on and on and on as a, as a preacher, she packed up a lunch for him, whereas probably no one else did. And so some people think that because this little boy brought out his lunch, everyone else did. But, who, but that isn't how it's written in the New Testament. That's not how John and the others record it. That Jesus performed a miracle that with just those loaves and fishes, Jesus fed that huge crowd of people on that, uh, on that day. Then the next story that John records in... Uh, in chapter 6 of his gospel, is that Jesus walked on the water. And you all know that story as well. But then something went wrong. Something went amiss. Because the people were still wanting to hear more and see more what Jesus could do. But Jesus and his disciples had literally just disappeared. They couldn't be found. And the people were saying, well, where is he? Why isn't he still here? What? We want to hear more. We want to, we want to see more miracles happening. But Jesus had gone. The disciples had gone. But eventually, they were tracked down. And so, not only was their angst within the, the, these, these, this crowd, but also in terms of the disciples because they were protecting Jesus. They knew how exhausted he was after these miracles that, that he had just performed and sort of was protecting him and keeping him you know, away from the people so that he could spend time with Father God. But, as I said, they tracked they, they did, in fact, track him down. But then Jesus turns to them. And the way that Eugene Peterson, in the message, translates that verse 26 is this on the screen. You've come looking for me, not because you saw God in my actions, not because you'd, see, you'd seen God in my actions, but because I fed you, filled your stomach, and for free. You know, Jesus, you, you get the sense that Jesus was a, was a bit annoyed about the fact that he, he just couldn't get away. And, and even more so, that they weren't really interested in what God was wanting to say. All that they wanted was to see more miracle. You know, do another miracle. Walk on another sea. Feed another load of people. You can do it, Jesus. Rather than listening to what God was saying through Jesus. And I think there's a message in that alone. That do we actually listen? Do we listen to what God is saying to us? Both as a church and as individual followers of Jesus. Or are we just interested in the exciting things? Have we got an ear open to God to listen to what he is actually saying to us? Okay, moving on. What I want to do is for us to think, what I want us to do is to think of food, as I said, but the two lots of food that are so integral in this story. There's the physical food as supplied by the little boy with his loaves and fishes. But then there's also the spiritual food 
which Jesus was, was desperate to get across to, to those who were, who were listening to him. And I want us to think about whether, in what ways are they the same and what ways are they different. But actually, the people were, you know, took Jesus back, not to that, that miracle at the beginning of chapter 6, but way back in the days of Moses, when God provided manna from heaven, this sort of magical, mystical food that appeared every morning and lasted just the day, or for two days, if it was the day before the Sabbath. But then it just turned sour and was of no good after that. It was just as a temporary fill, of temporary satisfying of the hunger that people physically had. And from this, Jesus makes the comparison between physical food and spiritual food. An interesting quote from the beginning of the 20th century, a guy called George Curry Martin said, when Jesus claimed to be the bread of life, he stressed a permanent truth, the nourishment of the inner life, the inner person, in other words, through the teaching and personal fellowship of the Son of God. It is himself the bread of life, as truly as bread is an essential of the physical life, so is he of the spiritual life of man. That we need both physical food and spiritual food. And so with food, you know, Jesus introduces himself as the bread of life because bread was the staple diet of that, uh, of, 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 of Israel. You know, if it was Jesus addressing a group in, in say, China or, or, or India, he'd probably say something about, you know, I'm the rice of life. Just to get across that point, the fact that our basic food is, he is, gives more of that in terms of spirituality than in terms of, of, of physical. Okay, as a little sideline, my wife has an observation. And the observation is about the men folk in our family. But can I point out that this does not apply to me? <laughs> All right. I can see it in my son. I can see it in my grandson. But no, it's not in me. And it's this that when the men folk in Sue's family get hungry, they get a bit grumpy. <laughs> now, I don't know whether that is true in your household or, 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 or not, but for many people, you know, it, it is. Okay, right. So, back to the script. And, you know, what does the question is, what does food physical food, do to us? What's its purpose? Why do we eat? Why do we have Sunday dinner, etc.? And this is a quotation from the Royal Society of Biology. Okay? Food provides nutrients, and nutrients are substances that provide the following energy for activity, growth, and all functions of the body, such as breathing, digesting food. I think that's brilliant. You know, we eat food, food so that we can eat food okay. and keep them warm, which I'm sure we're all aware of in the winter. Materials for the growth and repair of the body and for keeping the immune system healthy. So reflecting on that, I, I came to the following conclusions, that food strengthens us. Also, that food satisfies us. Yes, I heard at the back. Thirdly, it enriches us. And as a fourth point, it provides our required needs. And so, because of food, if you like, we have food to physically eat. 
But can we say the same thing about spiritual food? And I think we can, that we can use those same, those same thoughts regarding our spiritual food, the inner person that, that, you know, which is inside of us, the real us, not just our body. You know, that it strengthens us, it strengthens in our faith. It satisfies us because we worship and, and as we give our praise to God, so we receive something back. It enriches us as we come to God, as we walk with him, as we allow him to, to, to gather us up and move us on in the things of faith. And obviously, it doesn't provide for our required wants, but it does provide for our required needs. So, Let's think about that. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'll get there in a minute. Okay. So in terms of the soul, the spirit, our spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but our spirit, a dictionary definition is that it's the, the soul is the spirit of the immaterial, immaterial parts of us, the seat of human personality, the intellect, the will, the emotions. In other words, all those spiritual aspects of us. The other part of us, other than the actual, our physical body. And just in the same way as physical food energizes the body, so our spiritual food energizes the soul. And so the two work in partnership with each other. So what, what, what other than, than Christian things, of course, which, you know, let's take that for granted, but what energizes people? <clears throat> you know, the person in the street. You know, when something goes really well, you know, in, in terms of, of sport or other activities, you know, our team, our side, our, our, our group, we're, we're energized by it. You know, the, how happy we felt when, um, you know, we reached the, um, the, 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 the final of the Euros. I'm, I'm on dangerous ground here because I ain't got a clue about football, yeah. as most of you know. But then, what happened when we didn't win? You know, up, boom, down. We're energized by things that either happen to us directly or that affects us. The big things in our life, you know, falling in love, getting married, having children, uh, you know, great things happening throughout our life. It energizes us. You know, Maureen's just come back from a holiday, you know. She's come back energized because of having that time away. And, and things like, you know, things like that. The arts. Oh, right, the arts. Music, dance, drama, literature, etc. Energizes us, excites us. And then, of course, a beautiful scene. You know, that just takes our breath away. We're energized by those things. But we can also be energized by negative things. You know, oh no, no, that's not a negative thing. That's, you know, just when, you know, we achieve something in life, when personally we achieve something in life. We're energized by that. But then there are negatives. You know, when, a, when someone robs a bank and gets away with it, that's a negative thing. Well, to me it is. You know, but, you know, our energized, we've got away with it. And that. And dare I mention American politics, where people seem to be energized by the sort of things that I certainly wouldn't be energized by. That everyone is different. And that. But all of those things are only temporary, just like the food that when we eat, we soon are wanting another meal. 
to satisfy that hunger as well. And some people live for the latest kicks to keep them going, to keep them energized. Because nothing can last forever except for one thing. And that is the promise that we find in John 6 that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That which satisfies the soul is permanent, isn't here and then lost tomorrow. It is here for us. Just going through that passage again, some of the things that Jesus says and and draws our attention to, the fact that spiritual food lasts into eternity. And he spoke about food that endures to eternal life. Nothing tangible, nothing physical can we take with us beyond the grave other than our faith, other than our trust in God, other than the recognition that God, that Jesus is our bread of life. And it's Jesus who gives us that bread of life. And he then goes on also to say that it's God who gives us. That it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Because he sent me. It is from God. It is from God himself. But not only in terms of, of, of how, you know, uh, how we feel in ourselves, but how we see creation. But also, it affects creation itself. The, the 19th century um, uh, hymn by G.W. Robinson contains these words. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. We see something in creation because of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. Birds with gladder songs o'erflow, flowers with deeper beauty shine. Since I know as now I know, I am his and he is mine. And then the repeat of that chorus. Since I know as now I know, I am his and he is mine. And then, of course, in verse 35, where I stopped, is the great reveal. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, will never go spiritually hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again because of himself. But then he says other things as well, that as the perfect host, because whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. We may step back from God. We may walk away from him. We may let something cloud our thoughts regarding God. But God never drives us away. And throughout scriptures, there are examples, especially the New Testament, of Jesus not driving people away, but drawing them to himself. Zacchaeus, the crooked tax collector, the, you know, the woman at the well, the centurion who wasn't a Jew. Jesus has come to me. And that's what he says even now, to come to him, to know him as, to know him as the bread of life. And then it goes on, and this is where it gets a bit messy in terms of theology. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread, this bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. He gave himself. And what we do, we recognize that in the communion. When we take the bread, not 
turning it in our heads into the real body of Jesus. But it reminds us, it's the reminder, the symbolism of Jesus dying on the cross for us, of shedding his blood for us. And that because of that, we, if we know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, if we know him as that, then we will live forever with him in glory, eternally. I was struck during the week. I was looking through some, some notes that I had connected with the guy above me, whose name up there, Joseph Priest. And he was the first, if you like, the first real minister of the church here back in the 19th century. And from an early age, he, he said that I'm never going to preach a sermon unless I say something along the lines of you need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because I don't want anyone coming to church and not knowing that truth. And the older he got, because, you know, if you can... If you combine Ian McManus's time as minister and my time as minister and, and Ken Whitting's time as minister, you know, even that is only about a quarter of the time that this guy was minister. He was there for decades, centuries almost, it seemed. Well, Joseph Priest, the older he got, the more and more he spoke about the eternal city, about heaven and life after death. And he's reckoned... <clears throat> that his, 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 his preaching got better the older, he, the, the, the older that he got because of that message. And if you don't know Jesus as your bread of life, if you, you know, like the hymn writer then, you know, recognize that you see things in ways in which those that don't know Jesus can see. Praise God for that. But if you don't know that, if you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then he's here and he's wanting to say, I want to be the bread of life for you as, as, as well. And when we look at it as, when we tend to look at this um, understanding of the bread and the wine and what Jesus went through. Uh, a, a Bible writer called uh, William Hendrickson, in a sense, put words into the mouth of Jesus here, as, as though Jesus is saying, he who accepts, appropriates, assimilates my vicarious sacrifice, in other words, that's where we get the word vicar from, is that I died in Jesus is saying, I died in your place as the only ground of his salvation remains in me and I in him as the way to look at this passage. And for, thus, for those of us who know Jesus as the bread of life, as Lord and Saviour, I want to finish with this quotation from the late Michael Green. He is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and life. Most of all, people need to hear him, see him, feed on him, receive him. It is not surprising, therefore, that addresses, in other words, sermons or, or someone witnessing to you, which major on Jesus, are usually the most effective in drawing people to him. And there's a message for all of us there of not keeping it to ourselves, but sharing the reality of that with those around us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you refer to yourself as the bread of life. And Lord, yes, we thank you for the food that you provide, but we also thank you for the spiritual food that you provide as well. And, and Lord, may we walk in the reality of that spiritual food, that 
spiritual food, which isn't just here today and gone tomorrow, but is here for eternity. Because you are our Lord, and you are our Saviour. And may, Lord, we have the confidence and the ability to just to share in very gentle ways to those around us the truth of the fact that you are the bread of life, the only one who can truly meet the, with the spiritual needs of everyone across this planet. And so we come to you, thanking you, blessing you, that you are our Lord, that you are our Saviour, but you are also the bread of life. Amen. Can we continue worship as we sing a song very much based on Jesus, and that is Cornerstone. <laughs> 